My name is Jane Laporte. I have 10 years of experience in providing safety training and hope you will gain some valuable information today as you watch your video. Let's start with basic fire prevention steps. There are ways you can prevent workplace fires. Housekeeping. Keep work areas free of dust and lint. Discard waste in the proper receptacle. Keep combustible materials, an example of that is paper, away from heat and machines, especially space heaters, which can cause fires. Never place anything on a space heater, or for that matter, any closer than at least three to four feet. It's potentially possible that that could heat up and cause a fire. There's many fires yearly with space heaters. Flammable liquids. Follow the label and your material safety data sheets recommendations for handling and storage of your flammable liquids. Clean up spills and leaks immediately. Use non-flammable substitutes whenever they are available for any sort of cleaning. Use approved airtight metal containers that are kept closed when not in use. Ground containers during transfers. Use only in well-ventilated areas when you are working with, the, with these products. Make sure you open a door or a window to make sure that you're not getting those fumes into your lungs. Treat empty used containers as you would full ones. They are not to be reused for any reason. Remove saturated clothing as soon as possible. If you spill on yourself, you want to make sure you remove that clothing immediately and wash your skin thoroughly with running water. <clears throat> oxygen. Keep oxygen cylinders from contact with anything combustible. Make sure that they stay upright. Make sure that they are in their stands so they do not tip over. Do not light any matches or smoke around oxygen use. Electricity. Replace cords and wires that are frayed or have any worn insulation on them. Do not overload your circuits, motors, fuses, or outlets. Don't hook up four or five extension cords together because you want to have something running in a different area. You need to talk to your employer and maybe they need to put a new receptacle in. Don't let heating equipment or machinery run overnight if unattended. Keep machines and motors clear of dust and grease. Fuel and ignition sources. Smoke only where permitted in your facility. I would imagine that most of your facilities only allow you to smoke outside. Again, I'm going to talk about space heaters. Make sure they're in a well-ventilated area and do not fall over. In case of a fire, Keep fire alarms, exits, aisles, and sprinklers clear so you can get out, your residents or patients can get out, and the fire people can get in. How should you prepare for an emergency evacuation? Know how to recognize and turn in an emergency alarm in your facility. Know your responsibility under your emergency response plan. Act quickly when you hear an alarm or someone would yell fire. You might hear one of your residents or one of your coworkers yell fire in another room. You don't want to ignore that. You need to react right away. Turn off any equipment you are using. Close windows or doors not needed for escape. However, if you do not have time to do that, you make sure you get out safely before you do any of these steps. Alert other employees to the emergency. If someone is in the lower level or basement, if your facility is a private home type of facility, make sure that they are aware that there is a fire. Leave the area out your assigned exit. If you are supposed to go out the front door with certain residents or patients, make sure that that's where you go to meet. If your exit is not safe to go out, take the nearest, safest exit to get out of. Do not go out the one who, who may put you in danger. Don't block the path of emergency response crews or vehicles. So you want to make sure they can get up close to your facility. 
stay in your assigned place so the emergency medical personnel can count you because they will take a count and that's how they will know that you have gotten out safely. Follow all instructions given to you by your employer or the emergency personnel that come on. Now we will talk about fire extinguishers, different types and uses. There is some confusion with this and hopefully I can help you understand. A class A fire extinguisher is to be used on fires involving paper, cloth, trash, wood, any other kind of combustible like that. Note the numbers on the fire extinguisher. The higher the number, the larger the fire it can handle. Be careful not to blow burnables and create a larger fire. If you blow on a fire trying to blow it out, you're actually giving it more oxygen, which will cause it to be more combustible. A Class B fire extinguisher is to be used on fires involving such gases and flammable liquids as grease, oil, or any other kind of solvents you might be using for cleaning. Note the number again. They tell the square foot area that the fire extinguisher can handle. Class C fire extinguishers use on fires involving or surrounding any electrical equipment. Never ever use water on an electrical fire. It can actually cause more problems and you actually could become electrocuted. A Class D fire extinguisher is to be used on combustible metal fires. You probably would not have one of those in your facility. And then the most common in, in the um, facilities are the ABC or the BC combination fire extinguisher. And I would like to show you what more of a basic home type of fire extinguisher is. It may be hard to see on the camera, but there are the letters ABC down here. So you want to look in your facility what type of fire extinguisher you have. You want to make sure that you know where that fire extinguisher is located in the event of a small fire. Now we will talk about how do you use the fire extinguisher properly. First, you would pull the pin that is at the top of the can canister. You would pull that out. I'm not going to actually pull it out, but it's up here. Hopefully you can see it. Stand approximately eight feet from the fire. Aim carefully at the base of the fire. You can see on the fire extinguisher, you can tell exactly where the material would come out of it. Squeeze the trigger, which is back here. If the fire looks too big while you are attempting to put it out, sound the alarm and let the firefighters handle the fire. Do not try to be a hero. Make sure that you and your fellow employees and residents and patients get out of the home or the facility. Now we will move on to back safety. Back injuries cost you and your employer a lot of time and money. Many hours at work, home, and play are lost to bad backs. It is estimated that 8 out of 10 Americans will sometime in their lifetime have a back injury. And yet, preventing back injury is very simple. We need to learn proper lift, lifting, material handling techniques, eliminating excess body weight, strengthening neglected back muscles, so exercising is important, and adopting good posture habits. We all have a tendency to slouch down in our chair. We want to try to sit up straight. It is better for our backs. We want to be as normal curvature as we can when we're at work, home, and at play. Back injuries can also be disabling. Out of the 1.8 million disabling injuries that occur every year, approximately 25% of those injuries happen at work. For every back injury that happens on the job, more than twice as many happen at home or play. The personal pain and inconvenience that a back injury causes you cannot be measured, but we can calculate costs in dollars and cents. Back injuries cost employers approximately $6.5 billion a year. 
And employees then spend millions of dollars on their own just to take care of their back. Slowed production, increased turnover, medical bills, and pain. Bad backs are bad business for you and for your employer. Prevention is the best insurance to make sure that you're safe. By working together back to back, you and your employer can prevent a back injury from happening. Keeping your back healthy and keeping you on the job requires team effort. Management is committed to helping reduce back injuries at your place of employment. Back safety is a shared responsibility. It is something that you must work together with your fellow employees on. You are the key. First step, keep your back in mind when you're going to lift something. If you think about it ahead of time and picture yourself lifting that article or that patient, do it in your head first before you actually perform that function. That way you can figure out exactly how you're going to position yourself and when it comes time to lifting, actual lift. Lift everything twice. Do it in your head and then actually do it physically. If you think it's going to be too difficult for you to do yourself, you want to make sure that you request help from one of your other employees. There, are, there is a handout that was provided for you, and the title of that is The Anatomy of Proper Lifting. I'm going to go through with that just basically. How to lift properly. First of all, get a firm footing. Keep your feet apart, shoulder width for a stable base, and point your toes out. That way you won't topple over side to side. You'll stay stable. Bend your knees. Don't bend down at the waist. Make sure you squat down because bending down at your waist puts too much pressure on your lower back. Keep the principles of leverage in mind. Don't do more work than you have to. Trying to lift something by leaning over and trying to pick it up is too difficult. Maintain your three natural curves. Tighten your stomach muscles before you lift. Abdominal muscles help to support your spine, offsetting the force of the load. You can train these muscles to help you work. Lift with your legs. Let the powerful muscles in your legs do most of the work when you're actually lifting that item off of a floor or a table. Keep the load close to you. Don't carry something far out in front of you. Keep it close. It gives you better balance and you have better control over that load and you're less apt to topple one way or the other. Keep your back upright. Don't walk holding like this. Keeping your back straight, that also will help to keep everything better for you. How to lift a patient safely is also a handout that should be included in your packet. Evaluate the weight of the patient and ask for help. It's advised that if it is difficult or if you have a heavier client, that you do ask another employee for assistance. It's safer and actually you can get the job done faster. Keep a wide base of support again while transferring a patient. Keeping your feet spread apart again, shoulder width. Pivot with your feet. Do not twist your back like this. Make sure that your whole body goes at one time. Don't twist and turn. Keep the patient close to you when lifting. Use assistive devices if necessary. A gate belt, transfer board, draw sheet, a trapeze. A patient can grab onto a trapeze and actually help themselves lift over and or mechanical lifts. Don't be afraid to use those. They may be bulky, but if a client really needs those, use that. When lifting or transferring patients, maintain your lumbar curve in your back and bend your knees again. Don't keep your knees real straight. Use teamwork. Communicate with the patient and your other staff member. Generally, when you're lifting someone, you're going to say count on three, and then someone will count one, two, and then on the count of three, you will lift. So then the lift is done simultaneously. That way one person is not taking more of the load than the other person. 
Make sure your paths are safe when transferring the patient. We'll move on now to spills. What would you do if you either spilled water or some other liquid on the floor or noticed that there was water or some other liquid on the floor? The correct answer is that you should wipe the water or the other liquid up immediately. Spills can cause slips, falls, and severe injuries, including head injuries, um, hips broken, knees. It can really be disabling to both workers, residents, and patients. Be careful with liquids in your facilities to make sure that you wipe up after yourself. Ergonomics, that's kind of an interesting word that first appeared in 1949. What is ergonomics? What is the definition? It is an applied science concerned with designing and arranging things people use so that the people and things interact most efficiently and safely. Also called human engineering. This was from the Merriam-Webster dictionary. In other words, ergonomics is designing the workplace to fit the worker. The risk factors involved with ergonomics are excessive force, high repetition, awkward posture, physical stress, poor physical condition, vibration, constant vibration if you work on a machine, temperature, cold or too hot, lighting, noise, psychosocial influences like stress and motivation. You should evaluate your work area, your work tasks, your postures and habits within your work tasks. If necessary, you need to modify your work area, improve your posture, stretch your muscles throughout your shift. So if you sit for a while during your shift time, you want to make sure that you get up, move around, stretch a little bit, move your body to make your body looser. It'll be safer when you're performing your chores. Make sure you walk around at least every hour. If you're doing paperwork, make sure that you have proper lighting to prevent eye strain or headaches. Be aware of noise hazards in your facility. Inclement weather. What should you do if inclement weather is approaching? We will do a basic overview on this. I would imagine and hope that your facility has their own policy and procedure regarding this. So you want to make sure that you look up your exact policy. It is important to follow some basic guidelines when inclement weather is approaching. If you believe that this type of weather is coming close and could be severe, you want to make sure that you either watch TV or have a radio on so you can make sure for your area that you are going to be safe or whether or not you need to react. Make sure that your residents or patients are indoors, away from windows or doors that could cause harm. Close curtains, shades, or blinds to help prevent any cuts uh, from glass breakage. Move residents or patients definitely to the interior of the building. Continue to reassure the residents or patients until the threat of severe weather is gone. And now we're going to talk about material safety data sheets. What does MSDS stand for? It stands for material safety data sheet. What is a material safety data sheet? Let me tell you. About 32 million workers are exposed to one or more chemical hazards in their workplace. There are an estimated 575,000 chemical products in use today and hundreds more are being manufactured annually. This poses a serious problem for workers who are exposed to these chemicals and to their employers. A material safety data sheet gives us the information pertaining to each hazardous chemical that is in the product. Um, there's eight sections to a material safety data sheet, and the one we're really going to talk about today is section six. That is the section that contains the health hazard data, 
which includes the routes of entry. It tells you how it can get into your system, such as your eyes, your nose, your skin, if it's hazardous, if you get it on your skin. Health hazards, what kind of illnesses you can get if you come in contact with that chemical. The target organs, that if you swallow it or uh, breathe in the fumes from a particular chemical, it can maybe damage your liver, your lungs, your heart. The carcinogenicity, um, which tells you if it can cause cancer. Sign and symptoms of exposure, the medical conditions that can be aggravated. Let's say you have problems with your eyes and you get something in your eyes. It certainly can uh, cause more inflammation and more problems. And exposure and emergency first aid procedures. The emergency first aid procedures is probably the most important part of the MSDS sheet for most of you. If someone would spill, drink, inhale, have an incident with any hazardous chemical in your workplace, you want to make sure that you know where the MSDSs are kept and so you can find the book and then you can look at the health hazard portion of that MSDS. Now, all MSDS sheets do not look the same. They have to have the same information on them, but they do not look identical. So you want to look for Section 6. Um, please ask your employer so you can know and be uh, updated on where your MSDS book is kept. One of the other things I want to add is that if there is an incident, you want to make sure that you do call 911. This uh, MSDS will only give you the basics. We need to have the professionals come and really take over, and they can actually prevent more damage from happening. Now we will talk about latex allergy. What is latex allergy? Latex allergies are reactions to natural rubber latex products. These allergic reactions have been on the rise since the late 1980s due to the increased use of latex gloves and more latex in a lot of healthcare products to prevent the transmission of AIDS, hepatitis B, and other bloodborne diseases. Many physicians, nurses, nursing assistants, dentists, and other healthcare workers have been leaving their jobs due to latex allergy. This is mainly due to the increased use of the latex gloves in preventing transmission of infectious diseases. Some healthcare workers exposed to natural rubber latex develop allergic reactions, such as skin redness, hives, or itching. More severe reactions include runny nose, itching eyes, scratching throat, asthma, and possibly collapsing. What types of reactions are caused by latex? Three types of reactions can occur in persons using latex products. Irritant contact dermatitis, allergic contact dermatitis, and the true latex allergy. Let me explain the differences between the three. Irritant contact dermatitis is the most common reaction to latex products and causes dry, itchy, irritated areas on the skin, usually the hands. This reaction, most often seen in people who wear gloves continually at work, is not a true allergy. It is a reaction caused by skin irritation from a variety of sources. It can be caused by glove use, exposure to other workplace products and chemicals, repeated hand washing and drying, incomplete hand drying. You want to make sure you dry your hands completely. Exposure to cleaners and sanitizers. Exposure to the powder that's added to the gloves. The chemical sensitivity dermatitis or allergic contact dermatitis causes a delayed hypersensitivity reaction from exposure to chemicals added to the latex during the harvesting, processing, or manufacturing. These chemicals cause true allergic reaction, similar to those of poison ivy. If any of you have had poison ivy, you can relate to that. 
As with poison ivy, the rash usually begins 24 to 48 hours after contact and may progress to oozing blisters or may spread away from the area of the skin that touched the latex. So once you get that on your hands, it can possibly spread to other areas on your arm. The latex allergy or an immediate hypersensitivity reaction is a true allergic reaction caused by certain protein in the latex. Latex allergy can be more serious than either irritant, irritant contact dermatitis or allergic contact dermatitis. The proteins may cause sensitization, which means the worker has a positive blood or skin test for the latex allergen, either with or without symptoms. So you can have a latex allergy and really not be aware of it, and all of a sudden it can react at the constant use of the gloves. Reactions can occur within 10 minutes or hours of the latex exposure and can range from mild symptoms such as skin redness, hives, or itching, runny nose, itching eyes, scratchy throat, asthma, and possibly collapsing, as I said before. Reactions are similar to an allergic person being stung by a bee. Who is at risk for latex allergy? Persons with ongoing latex exposure are at the greatest risk for developing latex allergy. So healthcare workers are right on the top there because we are continually washing our hands, changing our gloves, putting new gloves on, changing them again, where our hands become dry, irritated. Studies indicate that exposure early in life and your total amount of exposure are two important risk factors. Healthcare workers who frequently use the latex gloves and other latex containing medical supplies um, can help cause this to happen sooner. There are a lot of the products in the medical field do have latex in them, catheters and different things like that. If you have an allergy to avocados, potatoes, bananas, tomatoes, chestnuts, kiwi fruit, and papaya, these uh, fruits and vegetables are associated with latex allergy, so you want to be extra careful. How common is the latex allergy? Recent studies indicate that from about 1 to 6 percent of the general population have a latex sensitivity. Of the 7.7 million healthcare workers in the United States, about 8 to 12 percent are latex sensitive. That really is a large amount of people. What you want to do is encourage your employer, and it is required actually by the regulations, that they must provide you with a non-latex uh, glove and materials to use in your job. So if they have not done that, it is your right to request that. Also, if you do use latex gloves, you would want to use the gloves without the powder because the proteins in the powder can cause the latex um, to stay on your skin even after washing and cause you to have a problem. Currently, there is no specific cure for latex allergy. We have only prevention, avoidance, and the treatment of symptoms. Once workers become allergic to latex, special precautions have to be taken, as I've previously said. But you also have to remember that those um, precautions have to be also taken in your home and out of the workplace. Although, cer although certain medications may reduce the allergy symptoms, complete latex avoidance is the most effective approach. The facility you work in has an obligation again to provide you with non-latex gloves for your use. NIOSH, which is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, has developed recommendations that you and your facility where you work can follow to minimize or even prevent the health problems related to latex allergy in the workplace. For your own protection, become familiar with the following recommendations promoting good housekeeping practices to remove latex-containing dust from the workplace, 
providing educational programs and training materials about latex allergy, and periodic screening if you are at high risk for latex allergy symptoms. You can take the following steps to protect yourself from latex exposure and allergy in the workplace. Number one, use non-latex gloves for activities that are not likely to involve contact with infectious materials. Two, if you choose to use latex gloves, use the powder-free gloves. Three, do not use oil-based hand creams or lotions when wearing latex gloves. This breaks down the protein in the gloves and can cause you to have a, a larger reaction. After you're removing your gloves, always wash your hands with soap and water and dry thoroughly. And number five, try to learn as much as you can about latex allergy through any employer you may have. Latex allergy is a real problem for healthcare workers, and you can help stop latex sensitization by following the recommendations that have been discussed here. I hope you've gained some valuable information about workplace safety issues. Thank you for watching this video, and good luck with the rest of your training.